Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, I, um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I'm totally unemployable. I've always worked for myself. And um, about 20 years ago, I was living in Texas. That's another story. I'll get into that, why I was there. But I started a company there. We sell movie libraries to the apartment industry. So if you live in one of these big apartment complexes, they have all kinds of amenities. They have a weight room. They have a clubhouse. They have a pool. And a lot of them have movies that you can borrow for free. A lot of those movies are provided by us. So I have this warehouse in Plano, Texas, and we send movies, DVDs, all over the country every month. And about two years after I started this thing, and it started to take off, my wife and I wanted to move back up to the Northeast. And I thought, what am I going to do with this company? It's too small to sell. It's just getting on its feet. And it occurred to me, there are companies where the boss isn't there. They have branch offices. The boss is somewhere else. I'll just pretend it's a branch office. And so I ran it from Connecticut. Well, it was in Texas. This was before the internet was popular. We would send, they would send me a, um, a tape of the computer system every week by FedEx. I had an identical system in my place and I plugged it in. And now we can log in and just see it all live and all that kind of good, good stuff. What I learned from that was to separate myself from the company. And at the time, I didn't realize how unique that was for uh, the owner of a small company. Shortly after that, I got into coaching. Somebody said, you ought to look into this coaching thing. You'll be a natural at it. And I said, well, what's that? Um, and that was in the mid-90s when coaching was starting to become a buzzword. I got involved, started coaching other entrepreneurs, and started realizing similar uh, patterns that they all had. And then about five, six years ago, my wife took over the Connecticut, I mean, the Texas company. So I guess that makes me a remote control CEO once removed or something. Uh, and I got into angel investing. That's how I ended up meeting Charlie and CI and CTEC and all these, these great organizations. And I've seen similar patterns with entrepreneurs in startups. But there's a, a significant difference in a startup company. And that's one of the things that I'm going to get into with you today. Um, I can actually skip the first few slides because this was about you. And um, I already know about you because you guys shared some really cool stuff. So here's my question for you. Any biologists, zoologists in the room? Why can't a lobster grow as big as a whale? And how many of you want to be the lobster, and how many of you want to be the whale in your business? Um, the reason is one word, exoskeleton. The lobsters have their crusty stuff, their strength, their protection on the outside, just like insects do, just like all shellfish do. And it turns out um, some, some of us are old enough to remember the, the scare science fiction movies in the, in the 50s and 60s of radioactive crabs that got as big as battleships and stuff. Well, it turns out that's physically impossible because of the weight-strength relationship of an exoskeleton. It just collapses after it gets to a certain size. And once nature figured out how to put the bones on the inside, then animals could grow a lot bigger, and hence the whale. Um, so what does that have to do with businesses. The exoskeleton word, if you will, that's comparable in a business of what limits growth or what allows it to grow is what I call is the business model. This is a simplified version of the business model. I don't know. Can you guys see it, read it in the back? It's the combination of three things. The customer's desires, which is, if you think about it, think about the last thing you bought. Maybe it was a cup of coffee this morning. Maybe it was a car. At that moment, you wanted that thing more than you wanted your money. It's that desire that fuels all business. And then intersecting with that is what you sell. If you're the coffee guy, you're in good shape. And the internal structures about how you sell it. And then, of course, your goals. Because your goals are why you're doing this in the first place. And if I'm, for example, if I'm an angel investor in your company, and hopefully you and I share the same goals, I'd like you to make 10 times my money back for me in the next five to seven years, or three times in the next two years. If you haven't taken anybody's investment money, you have a lot more leeway in your goals. I worked with a client for 10 years. His goal was to play golf three times a week and have a decent living. And he did. I, I worked with him over the phone for several years before we even met. When I met him, 
I went down to Florida. He drove me around. He said, I want to show you three houses. This is the first house. He showed me a house. This is the first house I was living in when you and I started working together. Then he showed me a bigger house. He said, then I moved to this house. And then he showed me an even bigger house. He said, now I'm in this house. And I still play golf all the time. That's a wonderful goal if you're a small business. Most of us have bigger goals than that, I would assume. We want co companies to expand. We want to be able to sell them. But that's what drives how you do these things. And when the, the three of them interconnect, you make money. And that's the business model. I'm going to give you some examples of interesting business models. This one you probably can't see. This is a picture from uh, Google Street View of Brookfield, Connecticut, where I used to live, a place called Four Corners. It's an intersection of Federal Road and Route 25. And they call it Four Corners, which I always thought was pretty stupid, because 99% of the intersections in America have what? Four Corners. This one's unique. I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually a gas station on each of the Four Corners. There's a mobile station here, a Gulf station here, that's the blue, a Shell station here, and this one's a BP station. An interesting Google Street Note, this one just became a BP station. It used to be a Getty station. And if you zoom around in Google Street Notes, when they went on the cross street, they took the picture at a different time. It's a cloudy day, and this is a Getty station. <laughs> Go figure. So Google's pretty, pretty amazing. What you can't see here bothered me for at least half the time I was living up in Brookfield. And that is that consistently, Two out of these four gas stations charged more for gasoline than the other two by three, four, five cents, and not just a penny. And it was always the same two, and it was always more. And like I said, the brands changed. This Shell used to be a Texaco. This used to be a Getty. The ownership changed. At one point, one guy owned three of them. He only wanted to own two, but he couldn't get rid of the other one in time. All that changed, and yet the pattern of the money was the same. And I couldn't figure it out for the longest time until it hit me one day. The two that were more expensive, the Shell and the Mobile, both had convenience stores. And the two that were not, both had garages. And all of a sudden it hit me, they're different businesses. They're different business models, even though they're both selling, all selling gasoline right in the same corner. When you're going to stop for cigarettes or a sandwich or a Coke, you're willing to pay a couple of cents more for gas. On the other hand, if you don't have that, you need to price your gas a little bit lower to sell it. That's the business model. That's the intersection between external desires and forces and internal stuff. I'll give you a couple other examples. Um, anybody ever used a Xerox machine? Remember back when they were actually copiers and not printers and scanners like they are now? Xerox invented dry copying. I don't know how many of you know this story. Before that, there was wet copying. They'd run these things through these machines, it would come out wet and it would dry and it would be a copy. But people were making 15, 20 copies a month, not a whole lot because they were wet and stinky and all that. And Xerox invented this real cool technology, except that it was expensive. So these machines were going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And people said, well, I know I like the dry stuff. It's a lot better. Why should I do that? Why should I pay that much money just because it's dry? And Xerox said, I'll tell you what we'll do. You don't have to buy the machine. We'll lease it to you for a very small fee. And we'll include a certain number of copies. And then as part of the agreement, you just pay for the extra copies that you make, two, three, four, whatever cents per copy. I don't remember the number. In fact, I never even knew the number. I'm making that up. Um, but Xerox said that, and people signed on and said, that's great. I don't have to pay any more. All of a sudden, instead of making 15, 20 copies a month, people started making hundreds and then thousands of copies. All of a sudden, there was all kinds of stuff to copy when it was convenient and dry, and Xerox went through the roof based on a business model. Xerox got their lunch eaten when the Japanese changed the business model on them by inventing small machines that were cheaper and that could be distributed throughout a corporation, instead of having one big copy room where you send all your stuff to be copied, you could now put these on every floor, practically every cubicle, and Xerox wasn't quick enough to adapt. So that's when they hit the decline. Again, it's not so much a technology play as it was a business model play. Um, give you another example. There's a guy 
whose business model goes like this. I will sell you something, but I'm going to charge you twice as much as it actually costs. And you're going to pay me, and I'm going to give you one, and then I'm going to take the money, and I'm going to buy another one and give it away to somebody in the third world. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Shoe company, Tom Shoes. This guy started a for-profit company to help kids in the third world uh, wear shoes. And so he's making money at this. In fact, he was profiled on the cover of Costco magazine. How many of you get Costco magazine because you're all members of Costco? And it even said in the article, they don't sell these things at Costco because he doesn't have the production capacity that their demand would inspire. And in spite of that, they put him on the cover of their magazine. And his business model is, I'm going to charge you twice as much and give one away. That's a very interesting business model, and it works for him. So there's all kinds of ways that you can change and tweak the business model and, and make money. Um, the trick is to understand that business model a profitable business scales to exploit that business model. You have to know why your customers buy. Tom Shoes customers buy for a very different reason than most shoe stores customers buy. They're not buying to get the latest fashion. If you've ever seen them, they're not that fashionable, I don't think. Although I'm not a fashion maven. So I have to disclaimer there. But people buy for a different reason from Tom Shoes. People buy for all kinds of reasons, but he only appeals to that business. And it said in the article, if you go to his uh, headquarters, you won't see it. There's no big sign. The place is a concrete floor. It has old plywood cubicles. They just reuse everything. There's no air conditioning. It's in California. And people love to work there. That's the internal side of what he does to keep everything cheap so that he can do what he does. That may not work for your business model, but a profitable business scales to exploit whatever your business model is, which looks like this. Oh, I went, went the wrong way there. And I, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but these are different, different departments in an organization. You have marketing, generates leads, passes the leads over to sales. Sales converts those leads to customers. customers um, buy something from the production department that makes something that the customers want to buy. The purchasing department buys inventory at the lowest cost of goods so they can do this as efficiently as possible. Collections takes the revenue and turns it into cash. Operations uses that cash to pay the bills. Finance uses the net profit then to pay off any loans or investors. The upper management says, well, we got some money here. We're going to give it back to the investors as profit. We're going to reinvest it in more marketing. And the thing scales. And that's what the concentric circles are designed to represent, that it's supposed to scale in sequence, in synch synchronicity with all these other departments. If you put a whole lot of money into generating more leads, then your sales capacity can turn into customers, it's, you're going to end up wasting a lot of money. If, on the other hand, you don't put enough money in, then you're not going to get as much sales and the whole thing cycles. So that's, that should not be news to anybody. But what this requires is it requires that you know um, what your business model is and that you have departments for all this. Now most of us who don't have big companies, we don't have departments for all that. But we still have all those functions that need to be done. You still need marketing to generate leads. You still need sales. You still need to buy something to make what the customers want to buy. You still need to pay your overhead bills, etc. But you don't have departments for all that. Instead, you got this. Can anybody relate? Even if you have employees, even as you start to grow your business, a lot of times people are wearing multiple hats. What I tell people at this stage is it's useful to know which hat you're wearing. 